Good morning, or almost afternoon. <laughs> yeah, come on, teachers. We know what to do here. Um, thank you for joining us today for this really, really special conversation uh, to celebrate uh, a really remarkable new children's book. Uh, you may not know, but less than two, less than one percent, one and a half percent of children's literature is written by and about Native Americans. So this is hopefully changing that tide and that we see more indigenous people uh, sharing our stories and our illustrations with a, a new generation. We're so grateful that you're here and I want to really say a, a special honor or have a special moment of gratitude for Joy Harjo and Michaela Goad um, again to discuss this collaborative project. Uh, the poem that um, is the center of, of this book, Remember, is one of my favorites by Joy, and one that I always uh, use uh, for creative writing exercises with all ages of students. So now we have a whole other vehicle to deliver that wonderful content. I just want to take a moment to um, acknowledge and honor the enduring relationship of the traditional stewards of this place and their territories and homelands. Uh, this recognition is a way to show respect for the histories, cultures, lifeways, languages, and contemporary contributions of indigenous peoples who have existed since time immemorial. In particular, the great nations of the Comanche, Caddo, Cherokee, Kawa, Wiltukan, Lupan, Apache, Kerun, Kawa, Tonga, Wa, and Wichita. So let's get started. Joy Harjo uh, was the 23rd Poet Laureate of the United States. She is an internationally renowned performer and writer of the Muscogee Nation. Joy is the author of nine books of poetry, several plays, children bo children's books, and two memoirs. She has also produced seven award-winning music albums and edited several anthologies. Her many honors, I need to take a deep breath here, Joy, include the Ruth Lilly Prize from the Poetry Foundation, the Academy of American Poets Wallace Stevens Award, two NEA fellowships, a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Tulsa Artist Fellowship, the Harper Lee Award, and just this month, a Bollingen Prize for American Poetry from Yale. She is a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets and chair of the board of directors for the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation. She lives in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where she is the first artist in residence for the Bob Dylan Center. I think that last one's so cool. <laughs> Michelle Goad is a Caldecott medalist and a number one New York Times best-selling artist. She is the illustrator of a number of award-winning and best-selling books, including one of my favorites, We Are the Water Protectors by Carol Lindstrom and I Sang You Down from the Stars by Tasha Spillett Sumner. Her latest title, Berry Song, is her first book as an author and illustrator. She is a member of the Clinkett Nation and grew up on her ancestral homelands along the southeast coast of Alaska, where she lives today on an island at the edge of the wide, wild sea. Welcome both, please. So I have a couple of questions just to get us started to talk sort of more generally um, about creativity and the arts. Um, I think you both span um, so many different genres, but in particular, if you could talk just a little bit about um, those arts, whether it be poetry, um, illustrations, how they have um, been a tool um, over the course of your life and sort of maybe how that tool has, has developed. Joy? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I started out uh, when I was very young. I, people had asked what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I say an artist. In my home, I had the art of my grandmother, Naomi Harjo, her paintings, oil paintings. 
uh, I was always doing art and music. And I went to, I got into Indi to, um, the Institute of American Indian Art in the late 60s based on my drawings and um, based on my art. But I, I had no idea I would wind up po writing poetry. That was not on my career list and you don't usually see poetry on, on career day for a reason. <laughs> but uh, I feel like I, I write like a painter sometimes. And um, I uh, was inspired when I read, heard of native, heard native poets for the first time, and I love poetry because, in a way, poetry does combine it combines images and music and and words all together, and that's kind of that's kind of how I got started. And actually, this poem was one of the earlier poems that I wrote, and I was asked because immediately when I started writing, people were like okay, now you're an expert, or what would you say to young native poets? And this poem came about. But I realized that, what I've realized with my work is that it's, it comes through. Yes, I have the tools and I have to hammer and put things into place to make the architecture and make it work. But there's, stuff is given to me. I feel like it's given to me. Like I open up and it's given to me. It's rough and raw, and then I help shape it. And this poem was one of those early poems that has grown to have a life of its own. It's on the Lucy spacecraft right now. And uh, it's uh, someone has been wanting to do a film for a long time, has been at me, and now it's finally, it, we're in a book, Remember, with Michaela's uh, incredible magical art. Hi, um, yeah, I was always involved in the arts from a young age, whether it was drawing and painting and writing um, or music and piano, musical theater. Uh, I just always loved having those creative outlets uh, just for, for self-expression. Um, I think for children, it's, it's really important. It helps children explore the world around them and their place in it. Uh, and so that was certainly the case for me for for art uh, growing up. And when it came time for college and to figure out what I wanted to do, which direction I wanted to head, I had no idea, I, you know, like Joy, I wasn't thinking of, of picture books or children's books. I knew I just wanted to be involved in something creative. Uh, and so I went to Fort Lewis College and I studied art and actually graphic design because I thought, I needed to find a job somehow <laughs> after graduation. Um, and I did work in that field for a while and I still enjoy design and, and uh, like art directing. Um, but eventually I really missed home and, and you know, um, culture and community and just missed that more personal creative outlet you know, that you had more as a child. And so I moved back home and was able to partner with one of our tribal organizations uh, in Southeast Alaska, Sea Alaska Heritage Institute, and they were working on a grant-funded uh, program called Baby Raven Reads, when the idea was Native stories by Native people for Native people. And so without any real like illustration, and especially not picture book experience, we partnered together and I worked on four books with them, and it was a really um, amazing experience. Like I was able to learn a lot about the picture book form, uh, and to work with stories that were close to my heart, close to our community, uh, and so that I really credit a lot to those early experiences. Uh, and then I worked on a book, We Are Water Protectors, and that really helped me understand that uh, art can be activism, which was really important for me, uh, just in learning that activism can look different. It can be different for so many people, and so that helped me find my voice and kind of the, the path forward uh, and I've just been really lucky to be able to keep working on picture books. And um, it sort of reflected or mirrored my own personal journey to reconnection and reclaiming my own identity as a Tlingit artist, um, Tlingit person. And uh, so I'm just really grateful that I've been able to work with not only my own tribal, uh, different tribal authors and organizations, but also uh, authors like Joy from completely different Native nations. Uh, so it's really been a wonderful learning experience in each book. Um, just has its own unique challenges and, and things to overcome and things to learn. I do have to continue to give a couple plugs. Um, we are the Waterkeepers 
it should be taught everywhere, all the time. Um, and if you haven't, uh, Joy's first anthology, uh, Reinventing the Enemy's Language, uh, was a watershed moment in Native American literature. And so if you haven't checked that one out, I would encourage you to. But now I'm going to jump back to remember, <laughs> because that's so important. Um, you know, I heard a common thread through what you were saying, and it's similar, similar to being an educator in a Native community. Um, oftentimes when we would talk to our students about what do you want to be, <laughs> many of them, especially the girls, said a teacher. Um, because that was the frame of reference for you know what they had for you know a profession or a career. There weren't many others that you know were sort of present for them. And so I heard you both sort of talk about well you know I, I found my way through art. I didn't quite know where I was gonna where that would take me or how that would become a profession. Um, so I'm just thinking you know what do you think about sort of young people? now um, being empowered by uh, seeing uh, that folks can become illustrators, can become graphic designers, can become saxophone players and poet laureates. Um, you know, how do you, how do you, what do you think about that? I keep thinking with this book, I got to see the book the first time yesterday with a good friend. We sat and opened it and started crying. I started thinking of all the mentors and the ancestors it took to get to here. And uh, I think of Nora Dauenhauer, who is sling it, and who was uh, a friend of mine, much older, a generation or so older than me, who did a lot for, I mean, culture is land, it's language, it's music, it's connection, it's plants, it's all of that. And I started thinking about all the mentors that I had that continue to teach me, just like a poem can be a mentor. Um, there are poems that, you know, Remember's been a mentor. I come, a lot of people come up to me who are, said, you know, that they've got that poem tacked somewhere. And that's what I started thinking about. I started thinking, too, about where we are in this time together and about the connection that culture and that we have, all of us, to, um, we are the earth, essentially. And the... All, the mentors have always taught me that. They've always taught me about connection and about how important language is and always the children. Children's education and books are probably the most important, yet we all know there's often a hierarchy in the literary business where <laughs> fiction is the giant master, <laughs> you know, and, but actually children's books are, that's how, you know, we've, we all carry that child within, and that, that is so crucial. It forms our, the shape of our minds, just like the plants do with our language, but that's another whole story. But <laughs> it's, it's so crucial, you know. Thank you. Yeah, I like to always share that I think, you know, picture books are really reflections of our society, and it's what we're choosing selectively to show our children and to teach our children. And so when you are um, misrepresenting or... Um, you know, relying on stereotypes or just completely excluding certain communities from picture books, that says a lot. Uh, and so I think just having stories like this is so important to Native children, Native communities. Um, and picture books are for all ages, so it's important for Native children and Native adults. And, um, and because, yes, that representation and that inclusivity is so important. Um, I was just had the opportunity to go to the Lummi Nation School on the northern coast of Washington State. And uh, I've just recently been able to start visiting schools uh, and their excitement and their joy was uh, overwhelming and was incredible. And I remember in particular, I was speaking with one um, high school, uh, one high school girl and she was telling me about a graphic novel that she was working on. And she, I could tell she was, you know, normally very shy and very quiet, but when she was talking about this book, she was just lighting up and she was full of pride and I could see it and she was really excited to share all about it with me and her teacher was there too and he was really excited and I think it's it's easy to I don't know forget the importance of those moments for for children uh, and to see the possibilities that exist for them and all these different opportunities um, and so yeah these these books we work on I work more specifically just in picture books but it's fun to think of them too as becoming mentor texts for children um, and other 
uh, Native writers today and who are up and coming, uh, for them to see that this is possible, that these books will receive awards and will be lifted up by others and championed by others is also really important. Um, and it's important for non-Native children and, and readers as well to see these books being celebrated because uh, that helps build empathy and compassion and, and greater cross-cultural understanding, which I think we can all agree we definitely need much more of in the world. Um, so yeah, these books, while I think can be deceivingly simple picture books, they are incredibly vital <clears throat> to these communities that we're working hard to represent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we know so much of the narrative about Native Americans, indigenous peoples um, over the course of history through historical texts, literature, um, pop culture. It's so inherently flawed <laughs> mm -hmm. and creates misrepresentations and stereotypes about Native people. Um, if you are curious, there is a wonderful, um, uh, is she Hopi? Is Debbie Reese? Oh, she's Pueblo. She's uh, Pueblo. Northern Pueblo. I, she has a no. wonderful website, De Debbie Reese Blogspot, and she reviews Native American children's liter literature in particular. So if you're questioning whether a particular text might be um, a, a viable one, an accurate one, I would, I would send you to her site. I'm sure she'll have a giant picture of Remember on there in about a week <laughs> with a glowing review. Um, Joy, you mentioned a little bit about um, mentors um, and how poems can be a mentor, but um, could both of you speak a little bit about um, maybe a teacher that has been important to you in your younger years or someone in your um, adult life as a mentor? Um, there are so many, but I guess Thinking of being a child, I remember art. I was always, the art classes saved me. I never, I wouldn't talk in class, but I could draw. I remember Miss Wastier in second grade and everybody was terrified of her because she, she wore her glasses and they were always slipping down to her nose. It was very thin and very exacting. But I like that she kept control of the classroom and she gave us very exciting ex assignments in art and she really cared. And I remember that, I thought, you know, we got a lot more done, and I loved, I mean, I, I probably would have been okay with anybody teaching art, but it, there was something about her, it was the caring, I think, that came about. And that goes, I've had amazing teachers all the way up through, I can remember a teacher in sixth grade that I've wanted to look up, Mrs. Robinson, and it wasn't about, she didn't t teach me about poetry, again, she taught me, it was the way that she taught everything in the way that you knew that she could know, she knew what was going on with each of us behind the scenes. And, Ella, you know, kindergarten, I could name teachers all the way up because school saved my, saved my life art. For a lot of these children, it saves their lives. I was really excited. Last night I finally, I posted, because I first got this, I posted it on Facebook. I'm not, I know that's not, I'm not on the social media highway because I want to live, but <laughs> others do some of that for me. And what was really cool is one of the first people to respond was a woman who sh showed her student who had taken, remember she used a lot as prompts or so on, I get a lot of notes on that, and they posted an image of her, said she didn't talk in class either, and she did this whole report and book and based on uh, the prompt on remember and wanted to send it to me. So... Anyway, there are so many teachers, yeah. I think my experience is really similar. The arts teachers really stand out to me. Um, I, I mean, I was a good student growing up. I loved all, all sorts of uh, classes, but the, the arts classes were always really interesting to me because I always found them the most challenging. Um, I always wanted to get good grades, and it was always really sometimes hard. to Like, it's so subjective, and they were asking such abstract concepts from you as a kid, and it so encourages a lot of this creative original thinking, um, and that's not always the case in all, you know, all classes and all curriculums. Um, so I always loved that about the arts and had wonderful arts teachers. I was recently at a conference, a uh, children's literature conference in the Pacific Northwest, and my old fifth grade uh, music teacher was there. I didn't know she lived in the area, but... Um, so it was really fun to get to see her. Um, and then one of my middle school coaches was there. So like, it was just really fun. The, the teachers have such important 
roles and like Joy, I can, I can remember many of them and I come from a small community so that probably really helps but um, yeah, arts teachers growing up through college as well, they just really challenged me I think and that's what I really uh, loved about it. And as more of an adult, I find the, it's called the Native Kid Lit Community, um, the community of indigenous writers and illustrators working in publishing today. They are an incredibly supportive bunch, uh, so kind, so generous. Um, Cynthia Lydic Smith is one of them. Uh, she also runs a heart drum imprint with Harper Collins, which is newer and uh, publishes native focused uh, literature, which is huge. Uh, and so she's a really big supporter of all books by all native creators, no matter your publisher. Uh, and she's been a mentor and Tracy Sorrell, who's another author, Cherokee author. And so just, you know, the, the women above me um, who've really worked hard to open the doors within publishing uh, have really been wonderful mentors as well. That's great. I do have to give a shout out to one of my best friends. She's the art teacher in my home reservation community of about 800 people. Go Fraser Bear Cubs, go Miss Heil. She moved there as a non-native person 20 years ago and is a key member of our community in so many students' lives, so I, I know what you're saying. And of course, Joy has been a mentor to me as a poet and writer over the years, and that's just, we understand you know, the relationships and the hard work that you do to build those connections um, with, your, with the young people in your lives and how much time you spend with them. And um, we know you do a lot and we just appreciate it. Yes. <laughs> so now I thought we would um, really just all sit in a circle, we can't do that, but, and listen, have Joy read Remember to us. He's going to run the clicker. Okay. Remember. Remember the sky you were born under. Know each of the star's stories. Remember the moon. Know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn. That is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away tonight. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath, your evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. Remember your father, he is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are, red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth, we are earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life who all have their tribes, their families, their histories too. Talk to them, listen to them. They are alive poems. Remember the wind, remember her voice. She knows the origin of this universe. Remember, you are all people and all people are you. Remember, all is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember, you are this universe and this universe is you. Remember. Thank you, Joy. You wrote that in 1981. <laughs> it was before then. It was it? Pu published. Sorry, it may have been, it was published okay. then, but I wrote it way before then. Which collection was it published in? I think it was in uh, the first in um, She Had Some Horses. She Had Some Horses. Yeah, okay. yeah. Which was published in 81. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so 
you know, just curious about sort of the poem, being with the poem and living with the poem and having it out in the world. Um, you know, what do you, what do you think about it now when you think about its, its lifespan and how it originated and sort of what it's come to be now that it's in this new form? I feel really grateful that I was taken care of because writing that poem was part of being taken care of by those, you know, who are the, that spiritual realm that informs art and creation and creativity and, and the creator in all of us. I mean, we were all created and therefore we're continually creating, whether it's our lives, our teaching styles, our, our art, uh, helping children you know, as, as they go on their venture of creating. And so when I look back at that, and that was quite some years ago, almost 50 years ago when I wrote that poem, I never foresaw the life that it's had. And I see so clearly now that it was teaching me. Because, you know, we can go along, but we, I'm a human being full of contradictions, and I have to be reminded <laughs> I have to be reminded sometimes, and I realize how much that I am in the service of, of um, in the service of being here in this community, in my own uh, community, tribal nation community, as well as all these different communities that I, we are all part of. And this earth, which is, you know, a ganajaga, and we, we can see so clearly now, all of us, that we, how connected we are and how much um, we are the earth, not just part of the earth, but we are essentially, we are the earth along with all of the other plants and beings and we're in a cri time of crisis. So for this book, it's almost like, okay, we're gonna plant this seed of a poem and it's going to find its way and it will root and it will, it will grow when it's at this time. That's what it kind of looks like right now. And then, you know, the, the press came along, you know, um, Random House and, and Michaela came along and Mandy's here and Mandy's, Mandy's always been here <laughs> with me with writing poetry. We're right, even though we might be far away and here we all are together. And um, it's, it's interesting to watch how these connections happen and ripen might be the word. You've had other children's books. How did this one sort of come about? How did this collaboration begin? And, and how did you pick Remember? Yes, this came about. I had the first children's book came out with a, it was a major press. And I remember I, I called them and I was all excited it was coming out. And I, I said, can I have the press release? They said, we're not doing a press release because it's a native book and nobody reads native books essentially. So it did win some awards and it's out there. A lot of people say it's their kid's favorite book. And the next one was one kind of a young adult uh, for Girls Becoming, a poem that I wrote for, it wasn't written to be published. I wrote it for my for first granddaughter's coming of age ceremony, but I read it at a reading and people, want, everybody wanted copies. And it's helpful. Again, it's similar to remember another kind of, you know, remember who you are and who you're becoming. And then this poem has always resonated. And I was approached with random, by Random House and we started talking and this poem, it just wanted to be there. And when it came to uh, thinking of artists, well, there was only one, <laughs> I think, it was Michaela. And I, and I remember too, it's like when we were first in discussion, uh, she asked me about, well, I can research Muscogee people and, and do it that way, or can I, she wanted permission to just do her ver her art. And I said, you're the artist, and w I want you because of who you are, your art, and what shows up in your art. So just do, do you. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about that, Michaela? Because I know I read something in the beginning, you were kind of like, what do I do? <laughs> Where do I go? Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, it came to me in, in, I think, typical publishing channels, you know, they acquire the text, and they reach out to the illustrator and, and see if you're interested. And, um, you know, when you get some inquiries, you, you sort of waffle back and forth on whether you should take them on or not, but this was just an instant, yes, clear the schedule, figure out how the heck to make this work. Um, 
because you just don't turn down text by Joy Harjo. So uh, I was incredibly grateful to be asked and to be considered and brought on board. Um, and yes, the, the poem is so beautiful and powerful, but also so simple and so open to interpretation, which as an artist is, you know, the sort of the best case scenario when you're coming into a picture book. Um, you know, just it's just a whole wide open world that you can just kind of come into and, and find your own visual story within the author's text. Uh, and I did play around with different approaches. You know, should I root the visual narrative in Joy's culture and community, uh, which would require, you know, reaching out to Joy and, and establish, establishing some connections and, and learning? Um, or should I, I also considered sort of following children from different uh, native communities. Um, which could have been an option as well, but again, it would require a lot more research. Um, and, and for this poem, it just felt so right to apply my own uh, more personal experience and, and worldview, um, referencing uh, Thinga culture. Uh, and just look at the nature of the poem. It's, it's remembering us each to uh, look at our own stories and our own histories of where and who we come from. So it just seemed really appropriate to do that myself. For this text and I hadn't actually done that before from a more personal lens while working with an author from a different native nation. I've usually always rooted it somehow in the author's uh, culture community. Uh, so this was a sort of a new adventure but it just felt really natural for this book. Well in in talking with teachers you know I feel like when we ask students to illustrate something they've written it's usually quite literal you know like whatever it is exactly describing what they see. But this, your illustrations in this don't do this. They really sort of expand out and breathe. So could you talk a little bit about your technique and sort of how, you, um, how you've settled upon the images to not just literally sort of describe what Joy was saying? Yeah, so I think I was really, I had that pretty strong epiphany moment when I was mulling over her first few lines where she uh, calls upon the readers to remember first the sky and the stars and then remember the moon and remember the sun. Uh, and that was a similar parallel to uh, traditional Shinget, uh creation stories with Raven bringing light to the world. First he, uh, he travels, up, travels up the Nas River, which is referenced in the sun illustration, and he tricks the old man who is um, sort of hoarding the, the boxes containing the stars and the moon and the sun. And he tricks his way, uh, different regions have different variations of that, uh, into the old man opening the boxes and releasing the stars, the moon, and the sun bringing light to the world. Uh, and so I was really struck by the similarity that Joy had in her poem in the opening. Uh, and so I was really inspired to uh, sort of create this more primordial ancient opening scene and then we're introduced to this young girl and sort of check in with her as she grows from, you know, baby to like roughly preteen age. Uh, and so we're just kind of seeing her grow up as she's learning who and where she comes from, uh, her family and community around her. And then she's called upon in the end to remember. And uh, I wanted to lean into the more, you know, multi-layered meanings and, and nuances because I have found that the more you lean into those personal details, the more universal it has, in that, that appeal is more universal and people can feel that authenticity uh, and then hopefully they're inspired to think of their own stories and uh, who and where they come from. Uh, and so I think, I hope that that resonates with, with many different audiences, young and old. Uh, Joy, you've talked about this already some, but um, you know, such a big, the way remember is centered around all living beings, you know, not just two-legged or four-legged, but our plant and animal brothers and sisters and the air and, and water. Um, and, you know, how we need to be generous with one another and really look after each other. And I think that is such a... Uh, I feel like over time and considering children right now who are have concerns about the environment and the natural world and just how much more aware they are than I was when I was 10, 12, 14. Um, and I think that, you know, having that, teachers having this group of students who are really um, passionate and um, 
you know, are concerned about their world. Um, how do you think, you know, some of those messages in Remember, you know, further, further those students' ideas and further the work of teachers who work with them every day? I don't know. That's kind of a big question. It is. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's a big one. I know. That, that's a book on ed, a childhood education out there that covers that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I don't know. You need, I mean, an image can be so powerful. I mean, think about the image of Earth when it was released by NASA. It was top secret for a while. They kept it top secret. That image was powerful to see the Earth as a being. That just changed everything. That's when you started hearing talk about climate, environment, holistic, and all of those terms came into being. And um, so I think like this, some of these images are just, that's what they do is they show that we are, that's what's so powerful about them. You just see that, that we're ultimately, you know, ultimately inextricably connected. And again, I go back to the teachers, and I, when I was a young woman, I used to go to those gatherings. They would have them in the Southwest, a lot of different healers and, and people who, I always like being around people who know things. And uh, it's too bad I don't remember everything. Maybe that's why I need remember. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> I need to remember. And I don't have the best, I said that in a memoir, and I realized, I said, I don't have the best memory, and I thought, a memoirist shouldn't say that right out, <laughs> right off about the mem. But what I do remember is those teachers, and I've been around some really incredibly powerful and beautiful healers, and those ones I stayed around are the people who would treat anyone. They would take care. If someone came to them and asked for help, they would help them. They wouldn't say, well, you're not my tribal nation, or you know, you're this or that, if somebody, because we're human beings. And yet we're focused through culture, and that's what gives color and diversity and so on. And I think for children to, they know. If you think about when you were a kid, you knew what you weren't even supposed to know. We all had experiences. We all had transcendent experiences, hellish experiences, or so on. And so often an image in a book or even words, I remember saying words over and over, little poems and things that would help me move through something very difficult. And, um, and also take my mind somewhere incredible. And I think that's, that's why we're here. It's because that happened for us through art or through children's books or through poetry or a song. And um, it's nourishment. You know, our, our bodies need nourishment of real food, not Barbie cereal. And so do our minds. Our minds, we need to feed our minds with nourishment, not like quick, quick stuff, like fast food images. And we also need to feed our spirit. They're all connected, of course, and that's another whole thing. But, um, and we need spiritual food for nourishment. Our children, really, they're calling out for that at all, at all ages, even all of us are, because we need, we need that. And this is generally right now not a larger society culture that is, it's, it's gotten out of hand with what brings money or what, um, and that doesn't work, then we wind up starving and we're hungry. And that's how I think the power of, the power of images, the power of poetry comes in. Yeah. Um, Michaela, something similar in your, your own writing and in your own um, work as an illustrator and artist, um, I think you mentioned earlier, you know, some, some of the texts you're working on, you know, have more activism in them for, for young people. So thinking about um, the natural world and the environment, sort of, you know, what do you lean into when you're, when you're creating? Yeah, I, well, a lot of what Joy said really resonated with me. Children do understand so much, and they come into this world understanding a lot of these connections. Um, you just spend time talking with young children and you just say things like, we are the land. And they just, they don't even, they just get it. Uh, and they, they innately know these things. And so I love leaning into that in picture books as well because when you're a child, 
you see the world with such awe and wonder, and there aren't these rigid boundaries between, you know, what you want to call reality and, and fantasy or the supernatural realms. They all really have a way of blending together. And so I, I've always really loved leaning into that in, in my artwork, and I find that, or I've found over the last several years while working on books, that those types of imagery or images and that artwork um, really resonates with children uh, and adults too because I think we all are hungry for connection. Um, I think collectively, yeah, we have moved a, a long way from, from a truly deeply understanding uh, our connections to each other and to the land. And so when I just really let that take the wheel in a lot of these books I work on, um, you know, I learn a lot through it as well. Uh, and it becomes a really beautiful symbiotic experience too of what I'm working on and teaching myself and then putting back into the artwork. Um, and, and I find children just really are, are, like Joy was saying, hungry, hungry for that. And I just love to explore, uh, you know, this theme of land as central to identity. And that's something I found too while working on books by different uh, author, you know, native authors from different nations. We all have different histories and languages, traditions, um, you know, very distinct, unique cultures and communities, and yet there are some things that lie the, the core, foundational, that are very similar. And I found one of those to be this idea of land as central to identity. Uh, and so sometimes finding that essence at the heart of all these stories has really helped me to um, just kind of visually storytell, you know, through all these different um, plots and characters. And, and so it was perfect for Remember, just to really have that lead the way and celebrate those connections. Great. Um, you know, I think a book like Remember, obviously, as we said, can resonate in particular with indigenous students because they can see themselves reflected in those pages. Uh, for non-native students to see a greater representation and to maybe sort of have, have some clarity and a connection or around true indigenous experience is so important. Um, you know, this book in particular uh, can be used in a variety of ways, various times of the year. Please don't just restrict us to November, <laughs> Native American Heritage Month. Um, you know, I think it can, you know, it, cross, it cuts across many different standards, different grade levels. And, you know, I've used it, as I said, to um, have students really, really pay attention to detail and to hopefully remember their own personal connections that they have in their lives. Um, I, I usually have it play, it play joy reading it first um, because I think nothing quite compares to her, to her voice and um, in her own work. Uh, but we do have this wonderful educator's guide um, that I have looked through and I think there are some really great suggestions in here uh, for using uh, Remember in your own classrooms. Um, and again, I think when, when students engage with this, they begin to really feel something. It really, you know, stirs something inside of you. And to try to cap, you know, capture that, that essence, and then to allow them to see their own experiences, the people they know, the places they have been, um, the ideas that are important to them that they want to hold on to, to really, you know, try to help them distill that essence. Um, we have about 15 minutes left, and we wanted to take some question, take some time for questions from you all. Okay, now here we are. <laughs> Technology. Um, your work often explores themes of spirituality. How does spirituality influence your creative process? I guess that's for me, but it could be for yeah, you too, yeah. as an artist. I think it's. I think we we are the world is a spiritual reality. It's not just in you know all of it, the good, the bad, the ugly. You know we're here. We're here in, I call it the story field. And there are no interesting stories if there's no challenge. <laughs> you know, you won't have a story. And I guess I've always, as far as how it, the creative process, uh, for me, what I love about creativity, whether I'm working on music or, 
or poetry or stories is being able to just, um, I have to work up to that point. There's a lot I have to leave behind to get there. But when I'm in it, and we can all get there by being out in the natural world, by just stopping and listening and just being, uh, when I'm in it, then eternity opens up and all kinds of things are possible. But it's getting there and getting to that place, which is, I think, hard, more and more difficult with all the earbuds and all the stuff, social media and the internet, we just get caught in that. And it's much harder, I think, to move out of that. And, you know, and of course, there's creativity there. I mean, that's all, all a creative process in and of itself. But for me, it's listening to what is beyond me. That's with poetry for me, poetry is about going beyond what I know and reaching a place beyond words. Yeah. Um, I think for, for me, um, for my creative process, I think I, I always have to make sure I am making time to do the things that really root the art. So that means making sure I'm also being able to spend time outside because it can be very easy to disconnect from everything that I'm trying to say in the art while trying to make the art and like what Joy is saying, enter those spaces uh, and it's really easy to get distracted and of course normal just creative block and imposter syndrome and all of those things, it's really easy to lose sight of what I'm actually trying to say um, and so I have to remind myself to make time and space for those real life moments that are, that are what really inspire the artwork um, in a very deep and also just very tangible level in terms of the imagery that I choose to uh, include. And when I'm depicting more you know, spiritual scenes or what I would maybe consider spiritual scenes, I also have to make sure that I'm leaving enough space for the readers. And so I do love to uh, play with you know, what you are and what you aren't saying and respecting the children and the other readers uh, and letting them bring their own perspectives and infer what they will and not feeling like I have to handhold and um, tell them everything literally. Uh, and so I do love uh, sort of playing in that space. This is a big question, but I find it <laughs> very interesting, the third one. What are some challenges of sustaining indigenous art and culture within colonial systems? Right? Mic drop. <laughs> I could speak just like a very uh, published, like the publishing industry obviously, right, isn't based on traditional more um, community or, or tribal values and, and for instance there are stories I'm interested in telling um, but because of, you know, where we come from, uh, certain protocols surrounding stories, you know, you need to partner very closely and work within your community on uh, when you're getting into territories of certain stories or even certain artwork designs. Uh, and so, you know, you want to collaborate more, but that isn't really um, easy within a lot of the traditional publishing. Uh, you know, they want one name on it. They just want to give credit to one person. Uh, and so kind of making space for those collaborative community approaches can be really challenging. I think it can be, navigate, you know, it can be navigated, but it's just, just in the early stages, I think, of figuring that out. That question is just so large, my <laughs> mind goes to about 10 places all at once. Because it goes back to a lack of respect. It goes back to why you don't see a lot of those tribal nations right here in Austin right now that um, Mandy mentioned in the opening. So that there's been so much we've had to recover or even just to live. And, and crucial to that, I think, for any culture are sustaining and, and, and carrying on classical knowledge through images, through art, because art carries, our arts carry our, our knowledges, traditional knowledges for everybody. It's not just native. And to maneuver through that and to sustain life at the same time, it's quite tricky. But the arts are so powerful I think we're all trying to figure that out and move through it in our, I see a lot of stories in my own Muscogee Creek community. I'm, I'm involved with many others on, on this, you know, and, and growing and creating and, and inspiring and carrying on our traditional arts, even as we 
expand them into like a children's book because that's part of our experience too. I mean, I think when a culture is, is alive, there, when a culture is living like a biosystem that's living, there's influences that come in and move throughout and we inspire each other. And then you take what's useful and then you incorporate it. And so there's a lot of that like Jimi Hendrix and in my work, or, you know, like a Coltrane. But at the same time, it's deeply, utterly Muskogean, and that's, that's the thing. But it's the respect thing to have to walk through what a lot of these children have to walk through in classrooms where they aren't, um, they're, uh, there's a hierarchy in which they're at the bottom, and that's a lot to negotiate. So we wind up with a lot of um, the suicide epidemic, within our communities. It's real. And um, I just had to narrate something, something that ended, the story was going along and it ended with this main character suddenly. Beautiful, beautiful young man. And it's like, what do you do with that? So all of this, and maybe, you know, we're in a culture that's suiciding itself because it's not, you know, we're all here to be helpful to each other and to, we all carry the gift of life. In our children, it burns bright. You can see that in young children. They come into school and their eyes are bright and it's wide open. Then you look at teenagers sometimes and you think, where did that light go? The same thing. And so, I don't know. This quite, I could, We could go on and on well, with it. You know, I think but, that was just a master class by both of them on answering that. So, <laughs> beautiful. Um, so someone asked about suggestions for fostering creativity. Which one is it? Wait, which question on there? Oh, I just, I just liked that question. How can I foster creativity? Oh. I think about my sister who taught at a little, for years, taught at Liberty Mound School in Oklahoma. You know, mostly Uchi Creek kids. And... Um, I would go, when I would come into town, I live back home now, but I would come into town, I'd always go to her class and read and talk. I just like to hang out. And, but the kids would come, Mrs. Barrows, can we write poetry now? I mean, how did that, she foster creativity? Well, well, she opened the door and said, well, this is normal, this is exciting to do this. I mean, there's all kinds of prompts you can give people and this, that, and the other. Or I remember walking to an art class as a kid and knowing that I was knowing that I could just be there and, and I, my, it was, I was free to express myself. So there's all kinds of ways that you can do that and art and in poetry and you know, there's one is giving permission, giving the tools and then you know, there's, there's just- Different something. examples, different yes. mentor texts and yeah. it's not one style, we'll speak to every child. Uh -huh. um, I'm sure there's some children who'll see the books I work on and not be as into them. And the next kid, it's like their very favorite thing in the whole wide world. And uh, I think probably showing just a wide array of, of different examples until something really clicks within a child, um, I think that would probably be really helpful. Or with an adult even, yeah. yeah. Well, and I think looking at examples from around the world, mm. not just from a, you know, a Western poem that rhymes and was written in England in whatever year. That's, that's nothing when I try to teach poetry, like sort of creates a you know, decline in the interest faster than that. So finding things, especially even contemporary, that they can connect to and you know, speak to their lives, that was always my first sort of gateway into poetry and creative writing was um, finding Native American poets who I was like, wait a minute, that sounds kind of familiar. And what does that mean in my own life? And how can I, how can I use that and interpret that? So um, the diversity of that, of what the art is representing, I think really matters. Let's see. Oh, that's right, I keep looking for hands up. <laughs> uh, they kind of scroll through here, so... Um, maybe that last one, yeah, that was something about, you know, I guess 
about tribal cultures. I'm just reading the last part of it in your work. Okay, on the subject of native creation, how I'll think. How do you balance specific representation on your tribal of your tribal culture in your works with the reads, um, needs and limits of a general audience? Everything is, it's funny, you get more question on it if you have an ethnic, it, you know, it's, everybody does that. I mean, it's, it's specific only if it's Jewish American or any other, or a European American culture, it's not so, I think the more specific you are, the more exciting it can be. I'm trying to think of some major works that, or um, that we all, it's like that first children's book I did. I basically told them, well, this is a book about a girl and her cat. You know, it can come down to that. It can be spe very tribally specific, but at the same time, it's like, well, remember the sky you were born under, you know? Well, we all, we were all looking at the moon last night. People are photographing. We all have that experience. And I think a particular diversity can give color. It gives a kind of certain lens and a color, but it doesn't say you're excluded necessarily. It says, look, this is an incredible, incredibly wide world with all kinds of experience. I mean, I read poetry and, and see art by people all over the world, and I can appreciate it. And I think children, I think, you know, I think, you know, I, I don't write to exclude. I write to experience and 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 it just it comes through my own lens i used to have people ask me all the time well do you write as a as a woman or do you write as a mosco i said i it's a filter i just write because i love what i'm doing and i'm in this community and this is where we are i'm convinced that every generation is a kind of person and comes in together and experiences that's kind of the short answer <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think when I'm, I'm working on picture books, I'm always very aware that I'm speaking to children, um, you know, all ages, up until grandparents, and, you know, all ages. I'm also speaking to Native people. I'm speaking to tribally specific, you know, people that come from my region, or community, Tlingit people. I'm speaking to Native people, um, the wider community, Indigenous communities. I'm also aware that I'm often seen as representing all Native peoples, even though Native Americans are not a monolith. <laughs> um, there are over there are close to 600 federally recognized tribes, hundreds more beyond that, just in this country alone. Again, we all are unique and have our own traditions and cultures and languages. So you're, you're just, you're kind of navigating a lot. Um, and also speaking to non-Native children, adults, uh, and realizing there's different gatekeepers, as there should be in children's literature, but there are uh, lots of different gatekeepers you're speaking to as well. Uh, and so it's, it's impossible to just not think about that all the time. So I, I do, I try, I'm getting more and more comfortable with leaning into my own personal experiences. And, you know, in the beginning, I was uh, less comfortable doing that. Um, oh, I'm getting the time. Yeah. Okay. Thank <laughs> That's you. that. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Thank you, Joy. Pre-order on Amazon. It's the number one children's book right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you. <laughs>